On your screen is a reply I had received from Jacoba Eveo of Teo Ministries in an old thread in the Biblical Rumble Room forum on Facebook, and I'll link to the relevant thread in the video description, but let me just say that it's not a recent comment, rather he posted that more than a year ago, uh, and I was, you know, it just so happened that I was thinking of making a brief video on uh, Kohelet or Ecclesiastes 9.5, and I remembered that comment, so I thought it might be worthwhile to show that comment as an example of someone citing the relevant biblical verse in the way that that's going to be explored in this video. But before I get to that verse, I, I wanted to note how in this comment, Jacoba said that he grew up Catholic. I, I've actually seen or heard him and his brother say that a few times, and I've long found that interesting because without any intended disrespect, they don't seem like they were particularly well catechized Catholics. Now, that's not to say that I'm any sort of great expert or scholar in Catholicism either, far from it, but even on really basic matters, they've said some curious things which raise questions about how familiar they were with the faith that they claim to have grown up in. Uh, for example, the first time I ever heard the Teo twins speak, it was on a show on Sister E's channel, in which Jacoba said at one point that quote-unquote Europeanized Christianity tells people to not read the so-called Apocrypha. And then later in the same show, he said that quote-unquote Europeanized Christianity is just Roman Catholicism. So he seemed to be under the impression that the Catholic Church taught people to reject the so-called Apocrypha, which is to say the Deuterocanonicals. Being in Europeanized Christianity, uh, we were told not to look at the Apocrypha. We were told not to look at the Pseudepigraphia. And, and so you didn't, because you think they're looking out for your soul. Yeah. You think they're trying to keep you on that straight and narrow path. And so if you look at it today, if we don't go along with the established agenda of European Christianity, which is really Catholicism, I don't care whether or not you call it Assemblies of God, whatever Protestant denominations, you know, Southern Baptists, uh, um, uh, you know, whatever denomination is still under the authority and direction of Rome. And aside from that, I remember Jacoba's brother, Teu, once said that he was under the impression that the Nicene Creed, which he heard when he was a Catholic, taught the same conception of God as oneness Pentecostalism, which is, it's my understanding, is a form of modalism. And in the video description, I'll link to a clip where you can hear him say that. But, but anyway, getting back to the topic of this video, the comment on your screen was in the context of a discussion, a correspondence on Marian prayer, you know, like the Hail Mary. And in that context, Jacoba objected by asking the following, quote, if the dead know nothing, how does one ask them for prayer, end quote, right? Like, for example, the Hail Mary asks Mary to pray for us. And then from there, he quoted Ecclesiastes 9.5. Now, irrespective of your particular stance on Mary and prayer or praying with the saints, I, I think there's a broader question here about whether that verse suffices as scriptural evidence against consciousness after death, right? You see, the argument, the, the broader argument, is that this verse describes dead persons as having no knowledge whatsoever. So this video won't be about Mary and prayer, per se, right? But rather, the question that's going to be explored here is the question of whether Kohelet or, or Ecclesiastes 9.5 precludes consciousness after death or consciousness between death and resurrection. And so with that in mind, I'd like to offer a more nuanced view of that text, especially the first part of the verse which Jacoba was appealing to, which in the King James Version reads as follows, quote, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, end quote. Now, what I'd like to do in this brief video is compare that text to 1 Samuel 20, 39, which reads as follows in the King James Version, quote, But the lad knew not anything, only Jonathan and David knew the matter, end quote. Now, the context of that verse in 1 Samuel is Jonathan was going to have a secret meeting with David against the backdrop of Saul's plot to have David killed. And Jonathan had a, a youth with him, you know, he had a young person with him, like an attendant, 
and he shot some arrows off into the a, a distance, you know, apparently in a field or something like that. And then Jonathan had that young person go and collect those arrows. And then he told the young person to take his weapons back to the city. Now, in that context, it was noted that the boy was unaware of what David and Jonathan knew. So with that in mind, I want to quickly discuss the structure of each text that you see on your screen. So, but temporarily taking the text off the screen, because I'm going to color code them, I would ask that you think of each text as contrasting those who knew a certain thing, which I'll mark in red, with those who do not know that particular thing, which I'll mark in blue. So the text in Ecclesiastes contrasts the living who know that they will die with the dead who, quote-unquote, do not know a thing. And similarly, the text in 1 Samuel contrasts Jonathan and David knowing the relevant matter with that young person who, quote-unquote, did not know a thing. Now, regarding that portion which refers to a person who, quote-unquote, does not know a thing, I'd like to look at the structure of the Hebrew texts which are behind these translations. So I would ask that you note that the portions which we're going to look at, the portions which refer to those who lack knowledge, take the following basic structure. Going from right to left, the structure of each portion will unfold as follows. First, there's the subject, which I'll mark in green. Then there's the negation, which I'll mark in red. And then you'll have the verb to know, which I'll mark in blue. And then there's the word meuma, which means a thing, which will remain in black. So the text in Ecclesiastes reads, Hametim enam yodim meuma. And the text in 1 Samuel reads, Hanar lo yada meuma. Now, the verbs are conjugated differently, with one being in a participle in the plural, while the others in the uh, singular perfect tense. And the precise negations which are employed are also different. But still, the structure of these statements are nonetheless basically identical. And I wanted to share this just to make this point. The text in 1 Samuel clearly and emphatically does not mean that the relevant young person lacked any knowledge whatsoever. Rather, it provides an example of how a statement of this structure can be understood as a sort of figure of speech, which can have a very limited universe of discourse. Once that's appreciated, it undermines the argument which appeals to Ecclesiastes 9.5. In that verse, too, the universe of discourse can be limited. The dead don't know they're going to die because they're already dead. They typically are not going to suffer physical death again, right? You, you cannot know that something is going to happen if that thing is not going to happen. So being that they're not going to die after they've already died, they can't possibly know that they're going to die because that's not going to happen. But whatever the case, that was the general point that I wanted to convey in this short video, that when one compares the structure of the relevant portion of Ecclesiastes 9.5 to the structure of the corresponding portion of 1 Samuel 20.39, their structures are the same. And just as the text in 1 Samuel does not require the conclusion that the relevant boy lacked any consciousness whatsoever, likewise, the text in Ecclesiastes does not require that the dead lack any consciousness whatsoever. As was just noted, statements of these structures can be understood as having a universe of discourse which is limited to the precise bit of knowledge included within that juxtaposition. Now, on a closing note, I, I do not claim that this short video answers every objection which might be raised by, you know, those persons who try to invoke the Bible to deny consciousness after death or to deny consciousness between death and resurrection. But I figured it'd be helpful to at least have this brief exploration as part of the conversation. I imagine that some might want to invoke the rest of the verse in Ecclesiastes, noting that it seems to state that, they're, that the memory of the dead is forgotten, you know, and perhaps they take that as meaning that the dead have no more memories you know, be, uh, because they apparently they have no consciousness. However, I would say that that's referring to the memories others have of them, not their own memories. And this can be seen by comparing the verse with, for example, Deuteronomy 32.26. But with that, I'll close the short video here. Uh, I may make more short videos exploring certain verses which are employed in polemics. But for now, I'll note that I look forward to any comments, questions, or criticisms. So feel free to share your thoughts, whether positive or negative. And God bless.